This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And so I want to give a special thank you to Juan San Miguel and Galena Fredkina, who both just made very generous contributions to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 534 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me Please and Other Stories, which is available now on Amazon.com. We had a great conversation about the book back in episode 500, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And today's guest is Warren Lapine. He's the author of the short story collection Just Like the Jetsons, and he's also one of the science fiction field's most prolific publishers, having worked on magazines such as Weird Tales, Dreams of Decadence, and Realms of Fantasy, and books such as The DNA Helix, Absolute Magnitude, and Fantastic Stories of the Imagination. And in this interview, we'll be discussing some of his projects related to legendary fantasy and science fiction author Roger Zelazny, including Shadows and Reflections, a Roger Zelazny tribute anthology, which Warren edited together with Roger's son Trent Zelazny, and Immer Zelaz, a compilation of hundreds of letters that Roger wrote to his best friend Carl Yoke. And now here's our interview with Warren Lapine. All right, so we're here with Warren Lapine. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I enjoy being here. I appreciate it. Okay, so how did you first encounter the work of Roger Zelazny? Well, do you want the long version or the short version? Probably. Let's the start short with the version. short version. Yeah. Um, I got a subscription to Asimov's when I was 13, and they sold my name to the Science Fiction Book Club. And I was a very poor kid who didn't have a lot of money, and it was like I was like all these books raining down from heaven. So I took hmm. all the ones with the most, uh, the omnibus editions with the most books. So I'd get the most bang for my dollar. Cause that was all it was. It was like 99 cents and you get four books. And uh, one of those was the two, the, vo- the two volumes of the Chronicles of Amber with Roger Zelazny. And uh, it just completely, I read those five books and it completely changed my life. My entire projection was shifted before I was done with the five books. Well, yeah. So you can say more about that. So how did the, what do you mean that it did well, completely changed your trajectory? I was growing up in a bad neighborhood. I was kind of a street punk. Now I've always been an avid reader. I started reading in kindergarten without being taught. I figured it out on my own, watching the teacher and my mom point at the syllables on the words. I just figured out how to read. I didn't figure out what letters were, but I could read. And so I've always been a reader. And so I'm hanging out with these street punks and just trying to figure out how to drop out of school, which they wouldn't let me do because I was only 13 and you have to be <laughs> 16 in the state of Massachusetts. So even my mom would sign the paperwork. I couldn't quit. And that's kind of the life I was headed for. And then those books arrived. And, and I read them and I wanted to, you know, Roger Zelazny is a writer's writer. He makes people want to write. You read what he's doing and you can tell he's having so much fun. You're like, I've got to be able to do that. And so I immediately wanted to become a writer. Well, you don't drop out of school and learn how to write. So I was suddenly a straight A student and I went to college and I had a whole different life than I ever would have had, had it not been for Roger Zelazny. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I actually, I read this, you know, I read um, Seven Tales in Amber that you yeah. edited, and you kind of talk about this in the intro, and I, I definitely want to hear the story. But so you said that, that Roger Zelazny changed my life twice. Twice. So what was number two? I, number two was I had started a magazine, because he did magazines. At one point, he was he was co-editing a magazine. So when I first got into the field, I thought I would do that as well. And I also wasn't very happy with the direction the magazines had taken since I'd stopped reading them as a teenager. So I was trying to go back to a little more classic uh, and and stop kind of being like boring French uh, hmm. uh, literature that I was reading in college. And everybody was aiming at that. And they're all like, well, this is pushing new boundaries. I'm like, well, the French did it in the 30s, dude. I don't know what new boundaries you're talking about. But uh, at any rate, uh, I did this magazine and then I found out Roger was going to be at a convention in Lynchburg, Virginia. So I 
three days before the convention, I called them to find out if I could get on programming and was stunned when they said yes. It turned out it was tiny. And it's like David Weber and and Roger and Jane Linsgold's ex-husband was running it and a couple of other people. That was all they had. So they were, he was like, yeah, what do you want to be on? I was like, anything Roger's on. He's like, okay, you're on everything that he's not solo on. <laughs> I was like, are you serious? And so I went down there, you know, I met Roger, I interviewed him. We started talking. I ended up buying a book from him or at that point I didn't buy it that day, but I, I, we had a deal within a month. I met my wife and that completely changed my life. <laughs> Well, yeah. So tell that story too, because that's a funny story. Oh, so I went to the convention and I got to meet Roger by going back uh, to to where he was staying, and and then I came back afterwards because he wanted a nap before the convention started. And I was just hanging out in the uh, in the hotel lobby because I didn't know anyone. I'd only been in the field for a year, and I was out of my geologic location. You know, I wasn't up in New England where I knew the people in science fiction, even though I'd been, only been in, active for a year. I knew a bunch of people and, and it would have been fine. But I was just standing there talking with uh, Jim Zimmerman, who actually has done a bunch of artwork for me since and who's also a huge Zelazny fan. And he said, hey, check out that really hot chick in the black dress <laughs> who just walked in. And I turned around and looked and uh, she was very attractive. And she locked eyes with me. And then I saw she was walking right towards a potted palm tree. And I was like, oh, my God. If she doesn't stop looking at me, she's going to walk right into that palm tree. I'm going to laugh and we will never talk. And she indeed walked right into the palm tree looking at me and I tried not to laugh. I almost succeeded. But when I went to talk to her, uh, she said, "The I said, you know, I wanted to make sure you were okay. And she's like, nothing hurt but my pride. Hmm. And uh, that was 28 years ago, 29 years ago. Yeah. And and the reason you had this sort of big rock star hair is, is kind of yes. what attracted I, her. I still do. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was in a heavy metal band all through the 80s and she was into the same kind of music. And I, I have that look. I mean, nobody looks at me and doesn't think rock star. <laughs> well, that's really cool. And so you said that on that occasion, you interviewed Zelazny and in, in yeah. this new book, Immer's Laz, it's this um, compilation of, of letters that Zelazny yes. wrote to his friend, Carl Yoke. There's an interview by you at the back of the book. Is it that interview? Or that did is you... that interview. That is the inter interview in question. Yeah. So just what was that like being such a big Zelazny fan and you meet him? I can't and... e even begin to express just how surreal it was because Roger's not a normal interviewer. You're, I'm interviewing Roger and I've got the tape there. And at some points he's sitting in the chair upside down with his head hanging where people's feet would be talking in the direction of the microphone of the uh, tape recorder. And he's spinning around the chair. At one point he's standing on top of the chair, talk, talking down to it. And then he's standing on the top of the back of the chair. And he was just in constant motion and just kind of twirling around in the chair, up and down and around. And I've never had anyone I've interviewed be anything like that. It was fascinating. And he never broke a train of thought. He was really focused, really good at answering interview questions, but it was surreal. You know, here's my hero, the guy who's changed my life. And I know that. And, and I see he's, it was just like, no, it was the only other time I was as gobsmacked is the first time I interviewed Paul Stanley of Kiss. Because <laughs> those were my two heroes. And so, so this was just, he had so much energy that he just. Yes. He just can't, he just couldn't be still, you know, when we started doing uh, panels, I'm on a panel with him and, and he, it, and, and everybody, of course, is, you know, saying, and hey, Roger, what do you think? And he'd jump up on the table and just talk from the top of the table while we're all sitting there looking up at him going, oh, my gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> it was awesome, actually. It was really cool that he wasn't anything like anybody else. That's really cool. And so then kind of what sort of interactions did you have with him over the well, years after that? Well, he only lived for another year. So... I, basically, we, we just talked shop about the book that I was about to bring out. I mean, I finished printing it the day before he died. And then I held off publishing it for an additional three months because I didn't want it to look like we were trying to profit off of him dying. I, I mean, I was heartbroken. I really couldn't even bring myself to do it, put the book out at that point until a little more time had passed. In, in your um, short story collection, just like the Jetsons, you relate this uh, experience you had where you wrote a story... Yes. Uh, called Gainful Employment. Yeah. Oh, why don't you tell, can you tell that story? 
Well, sure. When I finished, uh, when I finished it, I realized that it was pretty much a take on uh, the George problem from Roger, which of course was also he, he. When I sent it to him and asked him for permission to be able to send it out because it was so much like his, he said, "Oh, I don't see any problem with this." And it was later that I found out that you know that was pretty much a straight lift on his part from Kenneth Graham's reluctant, the Relu- reluctant dragon. So. I, I essentially, you know, that story is a, a homage indirectly to that, that I didn't even realize that it was in the same way that when I learned how to play bass, I ver- I play bass very much like Paul McCartney, but not because I ever learned any Paul McCartney bass lines. I never did. It was because I learned Gene Simmons and Paul McCartney was his hero. So your heroes, heroes reflect in your writing eventually too. That's, that that's kind what- of an interesting way. That's funny. I actually didn't know that about the George business, but it's funny because there was this high school student who submitted yes. it as his own. So it's a <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of uh, story kind of gets around, right? Well, in my case, all that was similar was the plot. I mean, I didn't steal any of his words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So then, how did you get involved in an editorial role with Roger's work? Well, you know, again, when uh, I was interviewing him, he was telling me about the publisher or the poetry book that he had and that he didn't uh, he, he didn't think it was going to happen. He wasn't very happy about it. And I said to him immediately, I just turned the microphone off for a minute and said, hey, look, man, if you need a publisher, <laughs> I will publish any book you write. I'll publish a book of poetry every year for the rest of your life if you want. Now, he knew he was going to die at that point. If you could have seen the look on his face, he was almost stricken. And I wasn't sure how to take that. And now I realize, you know, I realized later that it was like he always wanted to be able to write that much poetry and get it published. And here was the opportunity. It came too late. Oh, wow. And so so you published his his poetry book and then kind of what yep. where did that go from there with the editorial stuff? Um, I did that. And for the longest time I was, you know, I was busy at that point. Within uh, within three years of publishing that, I owned eleven national magazines. So I was just doing magazines. I wasn't doing books at that point. And it was when the magazine started to have issues because of all the advertising going away for the internet that uh, I started moving into books. And you know, a lot of Roger stuff was out of out of print. So I got in touch with uh, with his wife, who was in charge of the. But it was it actually it was the agent. And it was really clear nothing was going to go there. And at that point, Trent reached out to me, and he and I started to become friends. And so I was able to kind of backdoor some stuff in a way that you're probably you're not really not supposed to. But he was just beside himself because nothing was happening. And his dad's work was just disappearing. So he and I kind of got together and we would come up with projects that that the estate, you know, that his mom and that the agent would say yes to. And then I'd drop a bunch of money in their lap and we'd go ahead and do it. And that started to like wake people up to go, oh, yeah, Roger Celestine was really quite good. And then as, as things went on, you know, as, as Trent's mom aged, she started handing more uh, of the uh, responsibilities to Trent. And so I, I give them a much better deal on the books than anybody else would partially because I owe so much to their dad. Yeah. So, so had you met Trent or like, how did he know to reach out to you? I had not met Trent. Um, somebody gave him my phone number, I think, as I recall. It was a, let's see, considering where I was when the phone rang, it would have been 12 years ago. And I don't really remember. He sent me a story back in the day and I rejected it. But I remember thinking, well, it's better than the stories his dad was writing when he was 14. <laughs> That's cool. And so then have you, how much have you, is, have you guys just basically worked on these books together or do you see him at conventions or, or do you hang out? Oh, well, I, I mean, we... He's in New Mexico and I'm in Virginia. So we talk a lot on the phone and I go out to New Mexico once every year or two. And and we always hang out when I go out there. Um, You know, so that's right now. It's just mostly talking on the phone. But he and uh, his sister, actually, that might be speaking out of school. Well, no, I I did ask him about that. They're now completely in charge of the estate. So you can see virtually everything. All of Roger's books are now available, except for the ones that he co-wrote with other people in ebook form, at the very least. Yeah, that's really cool. No, it's been really exciting to see the all this all this stuff coming out and be available, like all the Amber books, yes. with new covers, and everything. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. I wish I could put them out in print. <laughs> 
But somebody else has the the print rights. Still, print right? rights, yeah, yeah. They're never going to let go of those because the books sell very well all the time. Yeah. So then, um, shadows and reflections is that sort of the first? Um, that first was book yeah. And- that was the first book outside of the uh, the poetry book. That was the very first one. Uh, so how did that sort of how did that project uh, come about? Well, that <laughs> so this is another one of the slightly longer stories. This this has been bugging me for thirty years. It had been bothering me because I read the story, The Night Kings. And Roger wrote the story. The premise of the story was to put every single popular cliche that was going on in fantasy at the time into a story, but have the story not be cliched. So one of the things that he did in the story, because it was a cliche of all fantasy at that point, was he set up a sequel. He didn't plan to write it. It was part of the joke of the story. But the, sto- the, the sequel blew up in my head full blown when I was 15 and read that story and it had been bothering me ever since, but I couldn't write it. I didn't have the rights. So I approached Trent about this idea for an anthology where everybody could write a story in any of Roger's worlds, except for Amber, which he had, pers- he had specifically requested nobody ever write in. So, you know, of course, Trent and I are going to, uh, as much as both of us love Amber and love to be able to play in that playground, we're going to respect that because that was Roger's last and his wishes. But I bought the rights to do that anthology so I could write that damn story that's been <laughs> bugging me for 30 years. Mm-hmm. So uh, what was that process like of writing that story? Like, how did you go about it? Well, I had been plotting it in my head forever. So when I sat down to write it, it just went. You know, it was it was almost like it had already been written. It just flew out. It took me a couple of hours. But I had 30 years of just <laughs> constant thinking about that story. It was driving you, me out of my mind. Do you want to just <laughs> say what it's like for people, what, what it's about? Just the basic. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the initial story is about a, a man who is kind of a, a power in the universe for good. And he owns a magic store and he's up against a guy who is essentially the power of evil. And in this case, it's science and magic. And that's not really explained real well, but that that's what's going on in the story. And in the story he, th- these guys have apparently been going at each other and, and dueling to try to change who's in charge for thousands of years if not tens of thousands of years and this they're getting a little older and they have these two apprentices that is also again one of the uh, one of the cliches that he was he was playing on but my story is these cliche these two are put in a position where they're now in charge and they take over and that's where I change it. But it's the same thing. It's this, it's this powers, uh, power for light and power for darkness constantly battling. So these two are now the ones that will be constantly battling. There was a throwaway line that I don't even think Roger thought about that he put in the first one. He said, you know, two like us should just drink wine and wander off into the darkness one day. So that was exactly what I had them do. You know, the story opens when, well, the story opens and then there's a flashback to where the woman calls uh, the man. I'm trying to remember both their names. It's been so long since I wrote it now. And uh, it was Vic and I don't remember her name. But at any rate, she called and said, you know, have you seen your master? She called him master. He called him boss. And he was just like, my ma- oh, my boss. No, no, I am not you know. She's like, last time I saw him, he was at my place. And he was like, I didn't know he was coming to your place. And then she said that they drank three bottles of Chianti and wandered off into the darkness hand in hand. And she hadn't seen either of them since. <laughs> so so when you're writing, do you try at all to make it sound like a Zelazny story? Oh, or in, do you... in that case, very, very much so, yes. So, make... I mean, he's a, I don't know. He, I mean, he's such an amazing stylist. Yes. Yes, yes. But I mean, part of it is I started writing right after I finished reading him. And, you know, he's been my favorite writer my whole life. And I'm always reading something by him. So if I want to cop his style, I can do it pretty handily. Now, as a writer, I don't try to do that all the time. I would like people to be able to read me and go, oh, yeah, I bet he likes Zelazny. But I don't (laughs) want him to read me and go, dude, it's ripping off (laughs) Zelazny. Yeah. So I actually have to, when I write, try not to write too much like Roger. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so you wrote your sequel, and then how did the rest of the um, Shadows and Reflections anthology um, come come together well, after that? We did a uh, we did an Indiegogo because we knew we were going to do it, whether or not we got the whole amount. It was, so the Indiegogo was just to pay the writers more, I and mean, we didn't use any of that money for anything other than going to be able to pay a, t- a higher rate for the writers. And there are so many people whose favorite writer is Roger Slazny that you know I had. I had big time writers coming out of my ears right away. So, you know, we, we, uh, we took the stories from the people that we wanted to get them from at first. And and then, then we sat down to see how full the anthology was. And that's when we opened it up. And then there's like four or five stories from uh, newer writers. Mm -hmm. And then, so what was the reception like to that book? Like what did people, uh, well, he sold a lot of copies. So that made me very happy. And I didn't see a single negative review. I mean, I no, that's not true. I saw one where somebody felt that none of the stories read like Zelazny and that they really should have put what stories that was that uh, each of these people had written. I'm like, yeah, I agree. We did. Did you look at the table of contents? Because <laughs> it was the name of the story, the author, and what Baloo the story was in. And apparently, you know, and I realized that they just they couldn't read very well. So I ignored that one bad review and all the other reviews were really positive. And what I was happiest about was that my story was singled out and almost every single one is one of the better stories or the best story. And I was a little concerned because, you know, when a publisher and an editor puts their own story in a thing, you can get bashed pretty hard. But that didn't happen. So that was very gratifying. Yeah, that's really cool. So so then tell us about this new book, Immer's Laz. Kind of how did that come about? Yeah. Well, that came about because I'd reached out when my magazine company went under. I was actually about to do a book with Carl Yoke that he had a new analysis that he had written about Roger. And then it ended up we, we weren't able to do it as I closed down the company. But when my new book company was really starting to make make really good gains and I had really solid sales across and suddenly I had money way beyond what I needed to pay my bills so I could start looking into doing projects with bigger named authors that I like to work with. And I just reached out to him and say, Hey, I want to do that book. And he's like, yeah, I don't even know where that book is anymore. Would you be interested in the thousand pages of uh, letters that Roger wrote me? <laughs> I was like, Oh hell yeah. <laughs> You know, and I had to reach out and, and talk with Trent and he was cool, but his mother wasn't because she was worried that Roger may have been bashing her all those years. The truth of the matter is there wasn't a single bash on her in all the letters that had to be removed. I had a, I've had people who've read it before it came out and they're like, look, I know the story. I can't believe that, that you guys took all that out. And I'm like, dude, we didn't take anything out. You know, there was nothing in there to take out. He never once bad-mouthed his wife in the letters to Carl. But at any rate, um, I promised her that if there's anything she didn't like, she could take it out. And the same with Trent and uh, and Shannon. And so they signed the contract and I put it, it took me two and a half years to get the thing in publishable shape. Yeah, so I'll just explain for listeners. So so Carl Yoke was Roger Zelazny's best friend growing up yeah. and they wrote and they letters together. The- Pretty much the day that they both went off to different colleges. Yeah. So so these letters go from 1957 to 1993. Yep. And it's almost a thousand pages of, uh, of yes. letters. Yep. Yep. It's, it's just really, really fascinating. I mean, if you want to know who Roger Zelazny was, these letters do that for you. Yeah, this was really amazing for me because, you know, I've read the um, the biographies that are out there and just yeah. every once in a while I'll, I'll meet someone who knew him and I'll just say, you know, can you remember anything that he said or, you know, any anecdotes or anything that you remember? And so just to have like a thousand pages of yeah. what he was doing every day pretty much, you know, yep. was, was just pretty, yep. a pretty amazing experience. I will never buy an eagle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. And for those who, who don't know what I'm talking about, Rogers Lasney owned a car. It was an Eagle brand car and it was just a lemon. And it did nothing but break down on him for three years. <laughs> he was ready to shoot it. I when could, it was all I could not done. believe. I was like, I'm thinking to myself, man, he probably wouldn't three he would have written three more books if he'd had yes. a different car. Yes, you know? yes, he would have. <laughs> he was so busy getting it to the shop and back and figuring out how the kids were gonna get to school. And his wife was going to get to work and he was going to drop the car off and then get back home to write. It was, yeah, it was something. 
Yeah. Uh, so so it's stuff like that. I mean, it's just, you know, he's he's writing to Carl yeah. and he says, you know, here's what the weather's like here in Santa Fe. And, you know, and here's where I'm taking the kids. And, you know, I, I went to speak at this thing. I read here's this book I read. I mean, yeah. it's this incredibly detailed just lots. Day by day. Of here's this book I read there. There's 50 over 50 pages of index because of that. You know, I was I was all set to publish it and I was talking to Chip Delaney about it. And uh, he was like, you know, you have to have that or the only people if you don't have a, a, an index, the only people that will ever read this are hardcore Zlazny fans. You put the index in and it's an invaluable resource to the entire science fiction field. And I was like, oh, damn, he's right. <laughs> but it's not an easy thing to put in that big a uh, an index. Well, well, yeah, I mean, you started to say that, you know, this was a lot of work putting this book together. You yep. want to talk more about that? Well, first, I had all of these graying pencil written letters to typed letters. It started with pencil and then shifted to a typewriter and then to computers. And some of it was, was good enough to OCR and some of it almost good enough to OCR and some of it had to be typed. So, I mean, there was almost a year's worth of work just to get this into a digital format that I could use to do the layout and design. And then just as I thought I was done, you know, I had to link all the table of contents because uh, with, with a, with an entry for every single letter, there's all, there's hundreds of those. And then I had to go back through and actually mark each thing that I thought was worth indexing with the, with the index feature from the program I was using and then go through and put them in. But then it turned out it wasn't a very smart, index program in that it like took everything with italics or not with it. It didn't, it left, it lost all the italics. So when I was done mm -hmm. and I had it all in place, I had to go back in and put all the italics in on all the stories. It alphabetized by the quotation marks. So I had to pull everything out mm -hmm. of there and put it where it belonged with the actual, uh, you know, based on the first word of the story, rather than on the fact that it was a story and that it had uh, it had quotation marks instead of italics. You know, and I had to go through and mark each and every movie he mentioned. But then, in some cases, he had read the book, seen the movie, and the <laughs> live play. And so, each of those are different, and they're each a different uh, entry in in there. And I have to make sure they didn't get mixed up. You know, because if, if you're not paying attention, I mean, Star Wars, are we talking about the series or are we talking about the first movie? You know, it's that kind of stuff. Well, I, I really appreciate you. I think I speak for all Zelazny fans. I really appreciate you putting in that effort because it's just an amazing resource to have. And it gave me, you know, like I said, I've, I tried to find out as much about him as yeah. I could. But it, this gave me a completely different picture of him than I'd had previously. I mean, yeah, same. you know, like, like when I was growing up, I'd always be reading Zelazny books and my teachers would say, oh, that's not real literature. You shouldn't be oh, reading that. Oh, they should that. have read it. <laughs> yeah. And, but so I always had this sense that he was, you know, adored within science fiction, within the science fiction community, but sort of, um, you know, ignored outside it. And I was really startled by how admired he was, you know, just yeah. in his life, how much appreciation and admiration he had from like Francis Ford Coppola, John Hughes, yep. Matt yep. Groening. Uh, he was invited to speak at all these uh, schools and colleges, and he was on all these uh, advisory committees and stuff. Like, yep. it, 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 oh, it, yeah. I was, yeah, go, no, go ahead. I would say one of the things that I, I really think worked in his favor is he was one of the most literate people probably to have ever lived certainly one of the most literate people of our century and he wrote like that but unlike most of the people who can write at that high level of literary uh, uh acumen he wasn't the least bit uh stuck on himself or pretentious and that really stands out you don't see somebody who can write like that who isn't going look at me aren't i special all the way through in the way that he never did that in my opinion yeah so so that really struck me and also just how rich his life was you know i mean yes. like like he read so much he wrote some i would sort of imagine having written as many books as he did, he wouldn't have time to do much else, but he was right, traveling, but he was going to plays and opera and jazz and dancing and raising three kids. And it was just incredible how much stuff he was doing. 
Well, as Stephen King points out, if you just write 300 words a day, and that doesn't take very long, you've got a novel a year. It's over 100,000. And he didn't have to write 100,000 uh, word books because he was writing in the 70s and the 80s, where 90,000 or 70,000 was perfectly acceptable from the publishers. Yeah. So, I mean, so yeah, it was... It was- gratifying to me to see that he he had a, a life oh, that yeah. was much sort of more yep. you know rich and I think enjoyable than i had sort of imagined he probably spent as much time doing martial arts as he ever did typing <laughs> yeah well not if you throw in all the letters he wrote to carl because <laughs> <laughs> that's um, an additional thousand pages you know of content that the world hadn't seen that he wrote and a Apparently, I haven't seen them, and I believe Jane has them. He had diaries that were even more uh, uh, detailed about his days. So I, I was going to ask you that. Out there. I was going to ask you that actually. So, so where are his where, are his diaries still around? Or uh, the, I believe they're with Jane Linskold. Okay. I could be wrong on that. That's what I believe. I also know there's probably at least as many letters in the different college uh, collections as these that are out there from letters that he wrote to other people that uh, that have been saved in his collections at the different colleges that he had collections at. That's cool. I guess we could mention, too, that this book has an appendix of letters that he wrote to Philip K. Dick. Yeah. Yeah. Those came from uh, from. All of them came from the period on um, when they wrote Desiree together. I probably just mispronounced that. I have a hard time with that word. And I don't know why. I took Latin in college. You could be better at it. <laughs> this this is the book. It's spelled D E U S I R A E, and it's a, a novel that Philip K. Dick started and kind of got blocked on, and then Zelazny wrote a chunk of it, and then they kind of uh, did a. He showed the thing. chunk. Yeah, he showed the chunk that he had written to to a. Uh, Philip K. Dick and Dick got un unblocked <laughs> and and immediately wrote the next chapter and sent it to Roger and then Roger read it and then he'd write the chapter and send it back to Philip K. Dick. And what's really interesting for me in those letters is you can see that when the letters start, Philip K. Dick is in a horrible place. He has no money, no prospects, nothing's going right for him. And the last letter, he's talking about how, how you know the movie's doing wonderful, the money's coming in, and this book sold better than anything he'd ever written before. And Philip K. Dick was in just so much of a different and better place than he had been when they were writing uh, to each other during the very early days with the book. Yeah, and uh, you, you really see how Blade Runner uh, made yeah, a big difference life. Yeah. for him. Yeah. Um, which un- unfortunately... Yeah, unfortunately, Zelazny never had that. I mean, like in one of these letters, he's talking about how, how Tom Cruise uh, is in consideration or that they've optioned Zelazny's novel Doorways in the Sand. I think it would have been marvelous for Cruise. You know, instead he did this stupid movie, uh, Vanilla Sky, which <laughs> the which was almost, except for the bad uh, the bad sophomoric jokes, really virtually no different than than Open Your Eyes, the Spanish version of the movie. In fact, as he had the same leading lady, it's kind of really interesting to watch her say all the lines in Spanish when you, if you you know watch the dub version, unless you speak Spanish a lot better than I do, uh, of that. And realize it's the same movie word for word, other than, you know, when he makes the jokes about being, you know, never mind. That could be <laughs> as places I shouldn't go. <laughs> well, well, let me just say, it's just pretty, like, mind-boggling to imagine Tom Cruise coming off of Top Gun and The Color of Money next yeah. to the Doorways in the Sands. So, like, there's but the an climbing history. up the building and stuff would have been kind of cool for him. You know, all that physicality that he likes so much was there. That's a good point. Yeah. So in um, in Doorways in the Sand, the main character, Fred Cassidy, uh, he he's likes to climb roofs. He's kidnapped. He's beaten up. He's constantly climbing the architecture, the colleges. You know, it's it doesn't feel like an adventure novel when you read it, but it is. Yeah. That's actually – I hadn't thought about that, but that's a good point. Yeah, maybe Tom Cruise could have gotten into <laughs> gotten some of his stunts in uh, – Yeah, he would have enjoyed then. that part of it because he loved it. He loves doing the stunts. Or yeah. so I hear. I don't actually know the guy. <laughs> no, I think that's I don't know me either, but I think that's a pretty safe uh, <laughs> yeah. safe bet. Um but so so how about when you were um going through the letters, kind of were there things that surprised you or that struck you? Um I remember the thing them? that made me laugh the loudest is he wrote a letter that basically just said, Hey, I found this amazing stuff. You can put it on Ritz crackers. It's called uh it, it's called uh honey mustard. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> Roger had never run into honey mustard till he was like 50. <laughs> um, so that was yeah. funny. But I mean, to some extent, there was also the little exchange about uh, the woman, uh, uh, ch- the children's writers and, and, and his views on the other writers that I found really fascinating. You know, all these other writers who are also people that I read and enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's one of the um, interesting things about the book is he gives his opinion and you know, he gives his opinions basically on every book that he reads. Um, yep. But so then a bunch of them are fantasy and science fiction. And so you get his thoughts on, and it's as, as they're coming out. So Right. You can kind of see, you know, before all these people were really famous, he was sort of, um, you know, he uh, homed in on, on who yeah. was good and, and so on. You know, there's one part where I was amused where he gave somebody the description they had written. And he said, and I promise you it's a better book than they make it sound like it is. <laughs> <laughs> I was also going to mention, you know, I mean, um, since I'm such a big Amber fan, there were just like details in the letters that were interesting yes. to me to see. So like, you know, the... In um, Night of Shadows, there's this Polly Jackson painting of a red shed. Yeah, and he owned it. Yeah, yeah. So I never, I never knew that. Yeah, that he. Well, why don't you go ahead and, and talk about that? Well, you know, he had just uh, he had seen the painting and he really liked it, and he bought it. And I think that it wasn't actually a painting of his car; it was just the car in question, the same model and make. I could yeah, be he, wrong on that, but it hung in his wall for years. Yeah, so I'll just explain for for listeners. So in in Night of Shadows, there's a mm-hmm. the main character Merlin is is sort of on this almost vision quest kind of yeah, trip to yeah, the, I would call it a vision quest to the to the underside of of the of, of the parallel worlds and um and at one point and he's trying to to escape and and at one point he comes across there's just sort of this this big I don't know there, there's a painting in of this red car and he's able to walk inside the painting and get into yep. the car and stuff and and so and drive off. <laughs> Yeah. So that was really cool for me to see. And then also there's a moment in um, Sign of Chaos when Merlin is falling down the rabbit hole and he sees writing on the, the sides yeah. of the wall. And he says it reminds him of something that he read in a, a short story by Jamaica Kincaid. Mm-hmm. And so then it was fun fun to read these letters and see, oh, here's where Roger read yep. that short story collection. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can piece the timeline together. So, it, it was... It was all very fascinating. What was also cool for me is now and then he's like, oh, I went out to dinner with uh, with George and we ate at the restaurant where Luke and uh, and Merlin had dinner before we're going off the Sandia Crest and all the, the gun, you know, on a, and the gunplay happened. So that was kind of neat is finding out where some of these places were. And it's funny because I didn't realize that one of his – and he mentions he was eating there quite often – is that I just put – chose a, a restaurant at random and we did a limited, very limited edition, 25, where everybody from New Mexico signed the uh, the Shadows and – no, it was – yeah, it was Shadows and Reflections. Uh, you know, George R. R. Martin and and uh, Jerry and and, and uh, Jane Lynn Scold and, and Trent and, uh, and Shannon. We were all there and it was his favorite restaurant and I didn't even know. <laughs> so I thought it was awesome that we all got there kind of in his honor to sign up this book that we'd all written in his honor in his favorite restaurant without ever knowing it was his favorite restaurant. Yeah, we no, got there you- and Jane was like, oh, my God, this was Roger's favorite restaurant. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, no, if you read this book, you're going to find out a lot about where Roger liked to yes. eat and what he yep. ate and stuff. Um, but, yeah, and also there's a lot about George R. R. Martin and Linda Snodgrass Fred C. You know, these all these, yeah. And, and for me, the most fascinating thing about that is reading it today, a modern reader will think that Roger is dropping George R. R. Martin's name all <laughs> over the damn place, but they won't realize what they won't realize is that he hadn't written Game of Thrones yet, and he wasn't half as well known as Roger. So he was just talking about his friend, and it may feel like he's dropping the name of the most famous fantasy author in the world. But he wasn't. It's just the way it looks, you know, 20 years after the fact, when that happened to, to uh, when all that got to happen with, for George. Well, it's funny because I think the first time George get, gets mentioned in the book, Roger says, you know, he's a really nice guy and he's a good writer. Yep. And he's yep. like, oh, yeah, he's a good writer. Yeah, George. Yeah. Yep. So. You know, I remember when I first met George and people would be like, well, who's George R. R. Martin? And I'd be like, oh, he wrote Fever Dream. You know, and that was... 
<laughs> that was his best-selling novel, uh, New York Times best-selling vampire novel. And that's what he was known for. I remember hanging out with him at conventions and there was nobody around but a couple of us. And now you couldn't get close to him. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've I've been a fan. You know, when I was yeah about twelve or thirteen, I read his story Sand Kings in the yeah. um, the Super Hugo's anthology, and and so I've been a fan of his since then. And yeah, so so it was I was a, a fan a long time before Game of Thrones. Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, he's a super nice guy anyway. So and, yeah. and apparently, you know, I haven't I haven't actually run into George since Game of Thrones hit. Although I owned Realms of Fantasy at the time, and we were actually going to do a special issue, but I sold the magazine just before that, and I don't think the new people did it, which is too bad. But in the end, he didn't need our help. Game of Thrones <laughs> just fine yeah. on its own. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So talk. So in, um, I'm trying to remember which book this was in. I think it was in. Uh, it must have been in. Wait a minute. So I've read every book he's written. And no, every it, it, short it, uh, story. Uh, it was in the mat. It was in the mat. That book, the Magic Ten Tales. There's a yes, couple yes. Um, intro e- uh, essays, and one of them is by Daryl Schweitzer. Yeah, and he says um, Zelazny, as a new wave writer, was a regular in new worlds in those days before he was summarily drummed out in early yes. 1968, presumably for the crime of being too popular. Um, I think there was more to it than that, and I can tell you what I think that is. Okay, all. yeah, go ahead. Well. You know, they published one of his stories and they they took they ax they screwed it up and they put like the beginning in the middle by accident. And everybody thought it was brilliant. And Roger <laughs> was very happy with that. And when it was republished, he made sure it was correct. And they never forgave him for that, that he let them let people know they'd screwed that up. And it wasn't him being artsy fartsy. They had just taken the front and put it in the middle for no reason. Huh. But I mean, it does seem I mean, this is my impression is that he was sort of um, penalized for being too popular. Or that- I, I do think so. And I always I always want to get to the people who are like, well, it's like he had all these magic tricks and he just kept putting them back in his bag. And I'm like, well, how many times do you want to watch him pull a rabbit out of the hat? I mean, if he's pulling the same rabbit out of the same hat, when does it stop being a trick? So because he was doing all those tricks and doing all those things he wanted to see about. I never quite understood why once he was finished trying all those experiments that he was after that they thought he should keep experimenting on stuff that didn't have any interest in for him. Yeah, they all wanted him to keep being this dazzling writer who went places no one had ever gone. And he was just like, but I was done with that. Now I knew where the edges were. Yeah, I mean, my experience, you know, because I, I was telling you a little bit before we started recording, you know, I, my first exposure to Roger Zelazny was The Guns of Avalon, which is the second Amber yeah. book. And then I just randomly happened to come across The Night of Shadows, which is the ninth. And so oh, I, I read them all out of order. And then it was after I'd read those, you know, many, many, many times, all the all the Amber books that I went back and read, you know, yeah. his earlier novellas and novels and so on. And so, um, you know... I have a completely different perspective, I think, than people who read everything in order as it came out. Right. And are maybe like really enamored with the early stuff and not so much the later stuff where I see I see them as a, mo- a lot more of a piece than than a lot of other people seem to. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think what happens is, and this will probably not make me any friends, is that most of the critics in science fiction don't even have a degree in English lit. And so they haven't even got a clue all the stuff that's going on in Amber. You know, the the levels and the numbers of uh, literary illusions in there is absolutely gobsmacking. It, there's almost a literary illusion on every single page. Yeah. But if you haven't read all that stuff, you're not <laughs> going to catch it. You know, if you haven't read any of the uh, Jacobean plays, you're going to miss all those. I mean, there's so many. I mean, there were times when I'm like, oh, that's got to be a typo. And so I would take uh, – the book and say, no, it's written correctly. And then I would then take that sentence when we were redoing them because we had to, we had to scan them. So they weren't clean and I had to go back through and fix every one of them. So I had to check every single thing that seemed a little odd. And it turned out it was just dozens and dozens and dozens of literary illusions I'd missed. If the sentence seemed at all, not in his style, when I checked it, it was an illusion. So is that available anywhere? That the, the, is, is I, that I a- unfortunately am a complete moron and didn't keep notes on that stuff. <laughs> I absolutely should have. Yeah, I would be totally fascinated if, if someone – because I mean um, – uh, is it Christopher Kovacs has done that for a lot yeah. of the things, yeah. gone through and yes. identified all the illusions, but I haven't you know, seen – And Chris helped out a little on this book too. I definitely want to give him a little credit there. 
you know, uh-huh. he read through for me and then gave me the uh, timeline and let me use his description of of Roger and uh, and Carl's private language that that kind of permeates the letters. Yeah, so so I mean, I've seen you know, I have his, I have the um the Nesfa Press um, right. short stories, and he he has he's he's a uh, done sort of a catalog of illusions for each of those but i've never seen um something that detailed for the amber books and i'd be totally fascinated to see that i would love to see that the person who should probably do it if it's done is uh daryl schweitzer because he will catch most of the literary illusions that other people would miss mm-hmm. yeah well i hope i hope he'll uh he'll get, get on that daryl yeah you want to see that <laughs> Ah, I should talk to Trent about an annotated, you know, annotated. Would we be able to do that without violating uh, whoever has the rights to those books? You know, in a print version. I know we could do an ebook version because we have because because Amber the Amber uh, limited Amber limited controls that, which means that you know Trent and his family own those. They own the ebook rights. Mm. Yeah, I mean, mostly I- because nobody asked for them in the seventies. <laughs> yeah, well, I can uh, can understand why. Yeah, yes, um, but yeah, I'd love to see that. So, uh, putting that out there into the universe. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, to some extent, I think you'd almost have to Google every single sentence because you will not catch it all if you don't. Mm-hmm. And even then, I don't know how much of it. You know, some of it'll still won't be there. But there was like a bit where he said. I forget how he put it, but brother random. And it was just such a strange sentence structure that I pulled it up. And then I found out that it was, it was from, uh, I forget whose, whose, uh, play, but it was a scene straight out of it, you know? And I remember watching, uh, I was watching a Agatha Christie movie and 10 little Indians, and I suddenly realized there's a bit when they sit down trying to figure out who the murderer is and the scenes lifted wholesale and dropped into Amber when they're trying to figure out who stabbed Brand. That is a complete homage to that scene in, uh, in Agatha Christie. And, and it's, and all the books are filled with that. And all these people, oh, there's just this, you know, this straight adventure story. I'm like, bro, that was anything but a straight adventure story. Hmm. There are so many levels going on and, and you're not catching them, which is just bizarre because they were talking about all that stuff. And Lord of Light, how did they not see that it all existed in Amber as well? You know, I have a lot of friends who don't like those books, who think that it's all Lord of Light or, or one of his other stuff. And I'm very surprised by it. I, I just can't reconcile it myself with what I get when I read them. No, I'm, I'm exactly the same way. And yeah, and there, there is, I mean, I, I, I would have never guessed this, you know, until I started going to science fiction conventions. I mean, just from reading the books, I never would have guessed. But there is this sort of like, I don't know, critical take that Zelazny went from being a experimental yeah, um, ambitious writer early in his career to being a more kind of predictable um, commercial writer later in his career. And uh, I mean, part of that is, as I was saying, you know, how many tricks are you going to do? Are you just a trickster or do you write? You know, so Roger had explored the stuff he wanted to explore. Was he obligated to keep pushing boundaries and explore because other people wanted him to if he felt like he had done what he had set out to do? You know, at some point you got to say, I accomplished it. Time to do something else. Yeah. But so I was kind of nervous going into this, uh, to these letters that there would, because I love the Amber book so much, I was afraid there might be something where he was just kind of like, ah, I didn't really care about this one. I just needed the money or something. But yeah, there's, well, there's I mean, really, oh, go ahead. Uh, he wouldn't let it. The only place he didn't want anyone else to write is in Amber. So whenever anybody thinks, oh, he didn't love Amber and he just pretended to because of his fans, I would ask, why did he care what was going to happen to it after he died if he didn't love it? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, um, there's there's some some things I I didn't know about where you know, I mean, he was it seems like kind of um, you know, under some deadline pressures when writing, yeah. you yeah. know, like uh, he mentioned like Sign of Chaos and some of the later some of those later books, but I mean, he always seems like he's enjoying what he's doing and cares about everything that he's yeah. writing, and there's also I mean, he turns down money. I mean, like you know, Gene Roddenberry offered him to write for Star Trek and he turned it mm-hmm. down because he just didn't look like Star Trek that much. And um, he finished Alfred Bester's Psycho Shop, even though it wasn't paying really anything, yeah. just because he loved Bester so much. And he he felt like he was the only author who could do justice to it. So yeah, you see, like everything I read in here just made me like him even more. 
Oh, I agree with you. He was, he just comes across as a, just a really good human being. Yeah. Um, he says that he doesn't, when he does, if it's a fan convention, he won't take money. He'll just, you know, yep. he has them cover his expenses, but he won't take anything about that. Well, I offered to pay for his time when I interviewed him and he was just, he, I saw him think about it for about two seconds. And he was like, no, nah, no, nah, we can just do an interview. I was like, thank you. <laughs> and then I was very happy. I had the questions written down because I was like, uh, uh, you're Rogers Zelazny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's always like that when you meet someone that you uh, yeah. admire that much. Yeah. 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 I also just want to mention so that some some fun anecdotes from the book. So there's this time where uh there's like this mafia uncle who calls yes. him on the phone. Yeah, yeah. I did do a little light editing there because I just left the names out. I didn't think people <laughs> Okay. I, I just didn't see how that could be any good for anybody. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we did edit those names out so that it wasn't obvious who's who. But you want to just tell the basic story? Oh, well, you know, Roger was doing – he had these two guys were doing a game and apparently their uncle was a mafia don. And uh, they were having a little trouble getting the company that they were working with who were interested in licensing it to, to you know, return calls and, and just basically, you know, they were a big corporation and, and they weren't really good at responding. And he gets this call from the mafia dons like, do you want me to send some boys over there so that they're more responsive? And Roger was like, um, no, <laughs> no, no, I don't. And he never told the two guys either that their uncle had called and offered a little bit of muscle to uh, make things go faster. Yeah, I just I want to read the exact quote. The guy says, uh, is this the kind of thing where I could have some of my boys talk to these games people? My boys can be very persuasive, if you know yeah. what I mean. <laughs> exactly. Sounds like a scene from a movie. Yeah. Um, and then also this thing about um, George Alec Effinger, Harlan Ellison, and Roger Zelazny uh, getting the um, the candy from the candy, uh, yep, yeah, from the uh, amusement park or the company that used to supply the candy to the amusement park that they all went to as kids. Yeah, and and so Harlan Ellison ends up. They find out that this uh, this company is going out of business, and Harlan Harlan Ellison ends yep. up uh, buying their their whole uh, supply of this. This That's great very candy much like Harlan. And putting it in his <laughs> freezer. And, and Celestine says, um, I'm still mad I didn't think of doing that. Yeah. <laughs> now, he and, uh, he and uh, Harlan had an interesting, uh, interesting, interesting relationship, I think. I mean, they liked each other, but it was always kind of interesting. Yeah, when uh, I think when Celestine in this book, when he first mentions Harlan, he, he calls him a, a buzzsaw that walks like a man. Yes. So that was yep. really memorable. Yep. Uh, yeah, and there's, there's like a... Uh, one of the letters was like Harlan Olson owes me fifteen dollars or something like that because <laughs> <laughs> he'd given the money for a magazine that never happened at a con back <laughs> yeah, before yeah, yeah. either of more neither of them were very famous at that point but yeah they were well they were like like teenagers or college students or something yeah. at the time yeah, yeah. yeah they didn't How grow up that far away from each other. Yeah. How about all this stuff? I didn't know any of this stuff about Zelazny being so into like new age stuff and um, like alternative medicine and stuff. Was that was that known or is that stuff? That I you think didn't... it was somewhat known because I wasn't completely shocked by it. And I'm trying to remember why I wasn't shocked by it. But I, I kind of knew my personally, I knew about it. But I'm also probably one of the two or three uh, most read, you know, doing most research and putting stuff out people alive when it comes to knowing about what Zelazny's life. Cause like you, I wanted to know everything about him. I wanted to understand who this person was who'd given me such a fantastic life just by his mere existence. Yeah. Without, but, you know, without trying to make my life perfect, he did. Yeah. Well, I'll just read um, a section to give people a flavor of this. So Please. he says, yeah. I've always had a strong mystical bent, but I've seen people swept away by too much of mysticism and metaphysics. I don't trust mystical experiences fully. I steeped myself in hard, practical, rational stuff for years as an antidote to counter this tendency in myself. So there is this really interesting tension where he's sort of by nature a sort of spiritual person, but then also yeah. has this like incredible scientific grounding and in, in all that kind of stuff. What I found interesting was take that and now go to the letter that – one of the letters where he was writing to uh, Philip K. Dick where he talks about the fact that he was actually uh, – he had uh, – oh, God, I hate losing words. 
What kind of <laughs> seizures? What is that disease called? Epilepsy. Epilepsy, that he was epileptic. And when he didn't take his medicines, he essentially had religious experiences. And so that sometimes when he was having trouble writing, he would do that on purpose. And it would break through. And it would give him a connection to the spiritual because, you know, people who had the kind of epilepsy that he had that wouldn't kill you, but give you visions and make you feel like you'd seen the God, those would end up being the shamans. And I often wonder if that's kind of what got Roger going down that road is those mystic experiences he had when he'd have an epileptic uh, episode. Yeah, it was it was really interesting. I, and I'd never thought of it quite in these terms before. But, you know, Roger Celestine and Philip K. Dick are two of my all-time favorite authors. Mm-hmm. And they both have this kind of, um, yeah, sort of mystical slash paranoid yeah. sort of yeah. um, outlook. And uh, I'd never thought of the Amber books as being paranoid. Like, I never oh, God, thought of yeah. it in those terms. But, like, you think of it, you're like, oh, yeah, like everybody turns out to have a secret agenda or be somebody else or, yep. or something like that. I, I remember the first time I, I have the uh, audio books that were put out by uh, God, the, 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 the outfit in uh, Santa Fe. Uh, At any Sunset, rate, Ro- Sunset. Sunset Productions. Thank you. Roger wrote them. So we were listening to those in the car going to Disney World when my daughter was, I don't know, eight or nine. And uh, I said, what do you think? And she looks up and she said, you know, I'd probably like this book a lot more if all the characters weren't insane. <laughs> and that was, you know, a nine-year-old girl's view of, uh, of what was going on. <laughs> they were just all crazy. I would, I would posit that, you know, they did both write about these realities you couldn't be sure what was real what wasn't and the difference for me was philip k dick's characters would be overwhelmed roger zelazny's characters would rise to the occasion figure it out and move on yeah that's interesting because you know i just always heard from everyone who knew him that he was just the most um you know kind polite sort of quiet person uh I forget there was this um, years ago. I there was some live journal I read where where this person I don't know who it was, but they said like everyone and every science fiction author is a complete piece of garbage except Roger Zelazny. That guy was a saint. Yeah, um, yeah. And, I've heard the exact thing said, but then they said Aladdin Foster. But you know, those are two of the nicest guys I've ever met. So yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm not endorsing that that view. I'm just uh, you know just the, right, right. I, even I, someone that curmudgeonly uh, loves Roger Zelazny. I was going to say, I've only met a handful of science fiction writers I thought were garbage. Pretty much, it's a really good, nice field. Yeah, but so, um, but it was interesting to me because he, you know, he sort of confides to Carl some of his sort of like more negative feelings. Yes, yep, yep. He did not ever let that out in the public, and so that was a thing I was a little concerned about: was how is that going to change the way people see Roger Zelazny? So I was trying to trying to be very careful about that. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was, I was so. For example, he says that you know, whenever he meets someone, you know, that he's always polite and friendly and everything. But he's always yep. sort of mentally preparing himself for an attack and like how he's going to respond and what cutting remark he could make. Right, which was interesting both to me and him because he was aware that he always did this, and yet he never actually destroyed anybody with all these notes that he kept on everybody. Yeah. And so I wonder what it was that made him feel like he needed that, even though he'd never actually needed that. If you know what I mean. Well, because he he says to Carl at one point, he says, you know, because again, they were they were best friends growing up. Yeah. That he says, I was always sort of, um, you know, you were always the one who was like socially uh, adroit and yeah. athletic and stuff like that. And so you kind of get the sense that I don't know, maybe he was bullied or insecure or or something, but he had sort of developed these. Um, you know, psychological mm-hmm. defense mechanisms as a reaction to, to something like that. Yeah, that's like possible. That. I, I have not read anywhere or seen anything that he or Carl were bullied. I mean, I know they both had odd parents, but I think that's that's all that I've ever heard about. Well, so maybe that's what it was because actually it was it was interesting because when I interviewed, you know, F. Brett Cox wrote a, a yeah. sort of academic yeah, book about Selassie. Yeah. And when I interviewed him, he said one of the things he liked about the second Amber series was he said that the um, he thought that the relationship between Merlin and his mother, he felt yeah. that it had it sort of struck a chord of uh, emotional truth or something. Yeah. Uh, this very fraught uh, relationship mm-hmm. that they have. Yeah, because he had and, a very fraught relationship with his own mom. 
Yeah, I was going to read. He says, um, my mother is stranger than she seems, though psychologically rather than physically abusive. It was my, it was actually my mother who bugged me so much over my father's death as if I were somehow responsible for it mm-hmm. that I started drinking heavily in the late 60s. In so, fact, I was just about to go there and you beat me to it. Yeah, that that is part of what he was dealing with. You know, I mean, I was amazed to find out he was drinking a fifth a day for a while. Yeah. Because that's in there. And then just, you know, he almost died. And so he stopped drinking. And then he, he, you know, talks about how he worked through all the different demons that he had. And then when he felt that, you know, he felt that it wasn't an addiction to alcohol that was an issue. It was the emotional processing that it was helping him do that was his addiction. And so now that all the demons were gone, he felt he should be able to have a drink and not slip back into old patterns. And as it turns out, that seems to be the correct thing because – I don't ever remember anyone calling him a drunk. And and he certainly, while he had drinks when I was there at the con with him, he wasn't anything, you know, outrageous. He wasn't yeah. even tipsy. So, yeah, I would say, you know, he was aware of that issue, but it didn't seem to be a problem for him once he had come to terms with the issues that had made him drink so much. Yeah, that that was really sort of um, nice for me to see because because I had a, again had this sort of maybe mis- misleading sense of him as having this tragic life where he had this horrible car accident and then dying yeah. very young, um, and and so just to know that he says you know that I had all this stuff all these issues as a kid, but I've he says something like I've I've put them on the shelf and I can take yeah. them off and examine them dispassionately, but then I can put them back on the shelf and they don't really affect me anymore. Yeah. Um, and so that was just really heartening for me to, to read that in, in these letters. I agree. It, you know, it was really kind of fascinating to see that kind of growth. And that was the thing, I think, that he was trying to grow every moment of his life in a way that very few people do. Yeah. And, and, and it's just, again, it's just amazing to see how much, you know, how many books he read and how interested he was yeah. in so many different subjects. And, and just like again, so tragic that he, you know, he he put so much time and effort into improving himself in so many ways, and then, you know, we lost him. So we early. lost him before before he accomplished everything he could have could have. I done. mean, I'm now a couple of months older than he was when he died, and that freaks me out. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think anyone reading this book, well, you you see like how what he had accomplished mm-hmm. at different ages, you know, is going to make you yeah. feel sort of insecure or sort of a uh, what's the word, uh, you know. Well, in my case, it's just that I'm still alive and he's not, you know, and still producing at this age. And and I wish that he could have. Yeah. In, in, inadequate is the, the word I was uh, reaching for I there. Mean, but... He did write 50 books, so it's not like he left us without much of a legacy. No, that's for sure. And, and well, I'm, I'm, you know, in, uh, in George R. R. Martin, he's, you know, he notes um, in his introduction to – uh, Seven Tales in Amber. I think that um, that's the last he was thirty seven, and he was guest of honor at uh, you know, I think it was at WorldCon. You yeah. know that he's just this incredibly precocious talent. Well, I, I yeah, I think it was amazing that you know he'd only written some short stories, and he got like a five or ten minute standing ovation when he <laughs> walked up to to get his first Hugo. Yeah, um, I'm curious about this too. So there's a scene in. Um, I actually forget which. It's one of the later Amber books where uh, Merlin is he, – he overhears a, con- a conversation between Ransom and Martin. Um, mm-hmm. Ransom is, is teaching Martin to play the drums or teaching drums, him yep. a, a drum trick. I remember the scene, yep. And it always struck me as, as seeming autobiographical or, or you know based mm. on some real incident or something. And so I never knew that Trent Zelazny was a, a drummer in a – like a yeah, actually, metal band or something. Yeah, one of the first things that uh, when when he found out that I had been in metal bands, uh, Tr- Trent was in punk bands. He and I talk music all the time. But at any rate, he immediately like started talking to me about that because like, oh, Trent would. I wish Trent was here. He would really be enjoying this, you know, because he's really wants to make it in a rock and roll band. And you were in a band that did all right. And I was like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah. So so I don't know if you ever talked to Trent about that, but do you think it seems like that was probably in you know inspired by Trent drumming or that that scene or i don't know i mean roger didn't play an instrument that i'm aware of but he loved music so he was always you know there was all that jazz stuff that he was always listening to and i know that he and trent listened to music together so so i could see how certainly that could have played to there i don't think that you know he ever showed trent how to play anything yeah you know, yeah, that he yeah. Could play. yeah i don't believe he played a musical instrument unless i'm wildly wrong 
Yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't remember anything about him actually playing instruments in the book, although like he was a, attending some sort of musical performance. Yeah, I mean, he-, he <laughs> On a nightly basis. And, yes, yes, I wish. I wish I could do as much. I live in the middle of nowhere, so I can't. But <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome that he got to do all of that. And, and, you know, I mean, I think that part of why his books were so much better than everybody else's. Yeah, it was just this, this breadth of his uh, interests. You know, there's all these people trying to- to, to top or or equal Tolkien. I'm like, well, sure, learn 12 dead languages, teach yourself high <laughs> Germanic over a weekend, and then write The Lord of the Rings. You'll be fine. But, you know, if you don't put in that work, you know, you want to be Roger Zelazny, read every book in existence, spend more time analyzing it than any other human being, and still write 50 books. There was also, it's it's fun, it's interesting too, because Carl is, uh, is also a writer. And so yes. they're they they talk and um so he'll send his stories to Roger and then Roger will give him feedback on them. Yeah. And there's a part where Roger says, you know, you've had your character the the character in in Carl's story overhears some key yes. yep. dialogue and and Roger says this is too contrived. You know, you need to make it less less coincidental. Mm-hmm. And it was making me think of there's this one of the scenes in the Amber books where um uh when I think it's when Merlin's at the Keep of Four Worlds, but he stops outside a door and he says, in a badly plotted melodrama, I would have heard some key <laughs> bit of dialogue, but I, I didn't hear anything. I had never and, made that. Well, I didn't make that connection when I was reading the uh, description he gave to Carl, but yeah, I totally see that. Although I hope that Carl didn't take it bad. <laughs> <laughs> a badly written melodrama, ouch. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, just the idea of, uh, you know, this is something... I, I don't know. I don't know if there was any connection there, but it, it did make me think of, you know, I could well, see that sort of being in his mind. a lot of those connections. I mean, the, the guy uh, who was guarding the pattern is Amber. His name was Roger, and he was down there because yeah. <laughs> there was nothing to do writing a book. And when asked for a description, it sounded a lot like uh, Amber. Oh, no, it definitely. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the, the description. It's like a um, a metaphysical drama shot through with elements of yes. horror and morbidity yep. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, well, there's Amber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, no, I've always loved that. Yeah. Um, the, and, and then also like you, you mentioned, you know, re- listening to the audiobooks. I would really strongly encourage people. You can find them online. Um, yeah. The I unabridged Amber books read by Zelazny. And they're just, they're just incredible, you know, and then obviously he knows what all the uh, inflections and, and yep. intonations and everything should be. Well, which is really cool for me, hearing the rhythm that really brought home the rhythm. Uh, I mean, because he was such a rhythmic writer. I remember when I first met my wife, one of the first things that I did on one of our dates was I read her Doorways in the Sand. And I had I've read it like five or six or ten times before that. But reading it aloud, I got all the rhythm and it was almost poetry from start to finish. It's his most poetic book. It doesn't feel that way when you read it, but read it out loud and you'll see. So you, did you, you're saying you read the whole book? Or just I read, read the whole damn book to her in the course of one evening. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoarse when we were done, but, you know, 28 years later, we're still together. So it was probably a good move. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I was just gobsmacked when he says that he read, he performed for, for the audiobook the entire book in of Night in the Lonesome October. October. And it's brilliant. I mean, I listen to, we have it, and we listen to one chapter a day every October because the, the book is set up in chapters. There's 31 of them and one is, uh, 32 of them actually, because one is the uh, prelude, which actually happens on the 30th of September. Yeah, so so he was just a remarkable audiobook narrator. Yeah. I mean, I've listened to those. Like, so have you times, heard those? Have you heard his Brack the Barbarian ones that he read while he was there for them? Uh, no, I, I have not but heard that. He wasn't able to go back in because he died, and so it's they're unedited. And there's a bit, there's a line in one of the Brack the Barbarian uh, novels where he said, "And he thrust her gently aside." And Roger giggled because it was so badly written, but they couldn't go back in and do anything about it because he was he wasn't alive anymore. But I just thought it was brilliant. You can hear Roger's reactions to some of the bad prose that he's having to read because he's reading other people's books. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to go. I'll have to go track that down. Um, yeah, yeah. He did a number of them for him. He did. Uh, he did a. Th- I think it was called the Thrillology, which was three of Robert Block's short stories. And he did uh, one of the Kane novels. 
trying to remember the name of that writer. He was pretty big for a while, but kind of vanished. Uh, is that died. Carl Edward? Carl Wagner. Edward Wagner. Thank you. Yes. And he also did two of John Jake's Brack the Barbarian novels. Well, because I've always, one of the things I've always loved about Zelazny's writing is he just has the best dialogue of any yep. writer. And it was actually really striking because he says, you know, that he was this quiet, um, sort of reserved person, at least when he was younger. And that he he says, I have thousands of three by five, you know, index cards in which I note the best lines and or thoughts in everything I read. I review six of these cards every day and, and wow. have committed most of their substance to memory, yeah. often their actual wording, mainly because I never want to be at a loss for such. So, you know, you know, again, he just sort of, you know, compensated for maybe some of his... Yeah. Uh, uh, inherent shyness by just you know becoming this virtuoso of uh, of wit and uh, you know charm. Yeah, and he and he was never as he said at a loss. I remember when I met him, I was struck by his voice and how well modulated and controlled it was, and it reminded me very much of Dick Cavett. And I told him that, and he was just beside himself, happy to hear that. And then I read the book, and I realized what an admirer he was of Dick Cavett. I had no idea when I when I told him that when I met him. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I also got to tell him that, you know, he'd saved my life. And he seemed really touched by that. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great that you had that opportunity. I was very pleased because, you know, not many people affect you like that. Yeah. And no, so I, when, you, when you can give them the thank you so much, it's 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 nice. Yeah, no, I would have, I would have loved to have met him. I mean, I was in high school when, mm -hmm. when he died, so I never, you know, that was yeah. a little bit before I started going to science fiction conventions. So, I, I had just, just just gotten into science fiction. I had just left rock and roll bands. I was twenty seven years old when I started. I think I was twenty eight when I met him. Yeah, I was twenty eight. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so we're running a little short on time. Um, I think we've mm -hmm. covered most of my, my big questions here. Um, uh, I don't know. Is there anything that you wanted to say about Zelazny or any of these projects that we haven't gotten to yet? I would basically say if you haven't read a book by Zelazny, it doesn't matter what it is except maybe To Die in Itlbar. You should pick it up and read it. And To Die in Itlbar is definitely worth reading as long as you read uh, The Isle of the Dead first and go straight into it without taking any time off. But every book he wrote, even even his most slight book, is better than a lot of writers' best books. I I don't think science. I mean, I mean, I know we'll have other people who'll be just as virtue, who well, should be able to show just as much virtuosity. But it hasn't happened yet in my lifetime before or since his passing. And there's just nothing like reading Zelazny. Yeah, and I, I would also um, put in a good word for his short stories too. You know, not yes. just the novels, but um, like this and, book uh, I mentioned, the magic mm -hmm. that you published. You know, yeah. would be a great place to to start with that. Yeah, unfortunately, there's only like one story of his in there. The rest are just people writing in his milieu. But uh, I would say my favorite. No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm saying the the, the magic was. Oh, the, the magic! Name. Yes, yes, yes. With the one that I did with uh, Samuel Delaney. Yeah, yeah. And that happened where he just walked up to me. Um, he and uh, his significant other came up at one point to talk, you know, just for a little bit because I've known Chip forever. And I uh, found out that uh, his significant other was a Kiss fan. So I gave him the Kiss interviews book that I had done. And Chip was said that's when he realized that I wasn't just a science fiction publisher. I was a real publisher. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But at any rate, he said to me that, you know, whenever he runs into a real publisher, he's had this thing he's wanted to do and he promised himself he was going to do it in like 69, which was get these 10 stories put together in one binding so that everybody could just see how much magic was going on there. And I'm like, Trent's my best friend. Let me get back to you on that. And within a month I had the deal done and we started working on the book. Yeah, that's great. No, I mean, I'm so, and I mean, I, I, I wonder, I mean, like if you had in, like you talk about how Celestine, you changed your life because you came across this, you know, the science fiction book club when you were yeah. a teenager and stuff. If, if if that never happened, if you would just never become a science fiction fan, never become an editor, how much of Zelazny's work would not be in print right now? I mean, it's just it's just such a um, yeah, I can't a testament that, but I, it's a scary thought. To yeah, it, but it's just such a testament to how much you know one person, you know, mm -hmm. how how you know the the the. 
I would say Trent gets just as much credit or should get just as much credit, if not a little more than I do. Okay. Okay. That's good. So you think that he would be? I think that he would have found a way. I don't know that, that, how to put this. I've thrown a lot of money into these books on the design and to make them look better and, and be a little more superior to what you would normally see from a smaller publisher, you know, and I don't know how many people would have done that. Yeah, I mean they do look really good. I really, I really like the uh, like the new Thank covers. You. Yeah, I do too. My, the guy that I got to do those is great. Who who is? I was curious. Who is the cover artist? His his name is uh, Jay O'Connell, and he did all the Amber books. He, I actually did the new uh, the new, but that was easy to do. I did the new uh, uh, Night in the Lonesome October. Because the back cover had been what Roger wanted for the front cover, and the publishing company had decided they wanted something slicker. And so they went with that horrible cover. That, I mean, it wasn't horrible, but it was horrible in that it didn't really match with all of the uh, Wilson, Gayhan Wilson stuff inside. And Gayhead Wilson had drawn that picture of Roger as the great detective and as himself as, uh, as Watson to to rogers homes and uh it ended up on the back cover because the publishing company didn't feel comfortable with something that wasn't really super slick so i just redid it using you know the same design that the book had but with the um, with the image that roger wanted you know what yeah. i kept seeing that people were always telling him they didn't want to do the book covers the way he did because the way books are selling and i'm like you morons people are buying roger zelazny's books because he's roger zelazny you sold most of your books before you even put a cover on it <laughs> it's <laughs> it's funny actually so how i how i actually discovered zelazny is you know my favorite author before that was robert Aspirin. i was really into the funny mm-hmm. fantasy kind of stuff as a kid yeah. and yeah. so i was just looking for more funny fantasy and um you know, there's no internet or anything. You just kind of go to the bookstore. Right. No, and- I remember trying to put my collection together that I have, you know, finding all of his books without an internet. Yeah. And so I, so I just saw The Guns of Avalon and I thought the cover looked a little goofy. And I thought, oh, this maybe <laughs> this is funny fantasy, you know. Oh, and boy. <laughs> so I kind of owe I owe the whole thing to, to that somewhat goofy cover. I mean, like, yeah. I think it's Tim White is the artist. I, I love his cover for um, Nine Princes and Amber. It's one of my favorite pieces of mm-hmm. fantasy art I've ever seen. But yeah. Guns of Avalon is a little the one he when he did. I thought was a little goofy. So I'm, I'm glad I the, the newer ones. Uh, I, I like yeah. better. Yeah, I actually managed to get my hands on and purchase the cover to uh, uh, the illustrated Roger Zelazny. So do you have plans for that or? Um, I wish I could do that, but I don't even know. I'm not sure. Uh, Those rights were tied up with with Byron Price and the people who took it over aren't really easy to deal with. So I don't know that anything will happen with that. I don't know. I'll have to talk with Trent because it's one of the only things we haven't done. Yeah, I, I guess I, I guess I was curious about that. Yeah, so do you have other Zelazny related stuff? Is there anything? Uh, did you um, yeah, to- I'm actually just doing the finishing touches. On we're we're going to put out one of Rogers' novellas in its own binding. So it's a, you know like a small hardcover, like the uh, if you saw the the versions that we put out. Well, you know, like uh, the Seven Tales in Amber, or or like uh, the one where we put the two Devil Car stories together, mm-hmm. or where we put the two uh, the two Oh, oh, what was that character's name? <laughs> I'll just say that the Scarlet Lady is the two devil cards. Yeah, yeah. Seven. You know, we we put together. It was oh well, the Scarlet Lady. But uh, I'm, I'm losing the name on the uh, character who was who was the main character and come back to the killing ground. Alice, my love. Oh. Hmm. And we put those two together because there was Califreaky, Califreaky of the Thread and Come Back to the Killing Ground, Alice, My Love, and just call it Califreaky because it's the same character. Well, we're thinking about doing that with some of the the longer uh, novellas. And the first one is Nine Starships Waiting because a lot of people have not read that. And I'm finishing that today. Oh, wow. Oh, I actually had to timing. stop working on it to do this. <laughs> you know, the front cover is completely designed and I'm working on the back cover now. And the interior has been done for a couple of days. Okay, well, maybe I should let you go so you can get back to that. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, but there will be more Zelazny stuff coming. Definitely more coming. 
Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, I will let you go now. But I mean, it's just I want to thank you again so much. Well, I appreciate for, it. It's really nice to hear that. For do, I mean, this Immer's last, it was like a dream come true. I, I said on Facebook, you know, my only oh, regret yeah. is that it's only 948 pages long. You know? Yeah, yeah. And if you look, it's actually longer than that. We didn't start counting until the first page because it was going to screw up all the indexing if we did that because the index wasn't smart enough to be able to see V, I, V, you know, V, V, I. Uh, so I had to just tell it where to start with the page numbering. Yeah. Um, but it's been so great talking to you. And so we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Warren Lapine. And again, this latest Roger Zelazny book is called Immer's Laz. So Warren, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoy talking with you. It's great to talk with another Zelazny fan. Yeah, right back at you. All right. Thank you. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Warren Lapine for joining us on the show. This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.